فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل بدعة ضلالة ثم أما بعد أيها الأحبة الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى بأسمائه الحسنى وصفاته العليا أن يبارك في جمعنا هذا ونجعله جمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا مغفورا له I'm going to start inshallah with the last, this very last sentence that I said. فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها and the worst of the affairs are the invented ones, the invented things in this deen, which is not part of it. وكل بدعة ضلالة and every بدعة every innovation is astray or misguidance طيب this last statement which is a part of an authentic hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم states clearly that every innovation every بدعة is misguidance what is a بدعة what is the bid'ah? We hear this word a lot. Innovation. What is an innovation or a bid'ah? I'm sorry? Anything that came after the Prophet or something that's innovative that didn't exist. Exactly. Something that invented is not part of this deen and someone is practicing it. Uh, he practicing it, uh, seeking closeness or rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's not part of this deen. So we'll have it rejected. Allah, the Prophet says, من أحدث في أمرنا هذا ما ليس منه فهو رد. Anyone invented anything in this matter of ours, means in this Islam, he will have it rejected. It will not be accepted from him. So the basic principle that before you act, before you perform any act of worship, you have to ask yourself two questions. Okay? قبل أن تعمل The first question the first question is why, and the second question is how. Why I'm praying? Why I'm fasting? So the answer should be to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? In accordance to the guidance of the Prophet sallallahu <clears throat> alayhi wa And those are, the, those are the two conditions that need to be fulfilled in order for our deeds to be accepted. To do it sincerely to Allah and to do it in compliance with the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Takuna ala hadi nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our topic is about fasting, but I'm going to start first about some of the guidance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before even the arrival of Ramadan. طيب. The Sahaba used to prepare to Ramadan way before the time of Ramadan. It was mentioned that they used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala earnestly, sincerely, an yuballighahum Ramadan. They used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make them live enough to witness Ramadan. Allahumma ballighna Ramadan. Allahumma ballighna Ramadan. And also they used to prepare for this great month by fasting most of the months of Sha'ban. You know today is the 29th of Rajab, and maybe tomorrow will be the first <coughs> day of Sha'ban. If not tomorrow, it will be after tomorrow. So the Prophet ﷺ used to fast most of the months of Sha'ban. Most of the, of the months is like 15 days or more. This is a well-established سنة ذات عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها قالت ما رأيت I never seen him the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم fasting more days in any month of the year like Sha'ban of course with exception of Ramadan because the internal mass has to be fast so this is a way to prepare also the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to give the good tidings the glad tidings and the good news to the Sahaba about the arrival of Ramadan أظلكم شهر كريم It's approaching you is a great month, a blessed month, the month of Ramadan. A month 
that Allah made it obligatory upon us to fast. قال فيه in this month the gates of paradise will be opened and the gates of hell will be locked and sealed وفيه تصفد الشياطين and the devils will be chained فيه ليلة خير من ألف شهر in it a night which is better than a thousand months ليلة القدر من حرمها فقد حرم whoever deprived the good or the goodness of that night he is the deprived this is an authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, giving the good news to the Sahaba to prepare to the month of Ramadan this is before the month upon the arrival of the month or say the last day of Sha'ban it is a forgotten sunnah that the Sahaba used to go out for sighting the moon this is a sunnah, a well-established sunnah that people, the communities, they go outside, they take their children and they go outside to sight the moon. Unfortunately, this is seldomly done in here or even back home. <clears throat> it is a forgotten sunnah. So I mentioned in many hadith that the Sahaba, they used to go out to sight the moon. <clears throat> because the beginning of the month depends on the citation of the moon. Or, if you are able to sight the moon, then we would complete Sha'ban as 30 days. فَإِنْ غُمَّ عَلَيْكُمْ فَإِنْ غُبِّيَ عَلَيْكُمْ فَأَكْمِلُوا عِدَّةَ شَعْبَان If you are, if you are not able to, to, to sight the moon because of clouds or the like, then you have to complete Sha'ban as 30 days. Okay, so we need to revive the Sunnah. We have to have peoples from our communities try to go outside to the countryside to try to sight the moon of the month of Ramadan. Type During the month, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to do many acts of worship and he exerted more effort during the month more than any month, more than any other month. In his ibadah, you know, in his prayers, in his dhikr uh, of Allah, and also the Sahaba, they used to do the same. And also, generosity and spending for the sake of Allah. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس Ordinarily, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is the most generous, generous person. وكان وأجود ما يكون في رمضان And he will increase in his generosity and spending for the, for the cause of Allah, especially in the month of Ramadan. قال حين يلقاه جبريل when he meets جبريل عليه السلام فلا رسول الله أجود من خير من الريح المصلى so we have to spend we have to give for the sake of الله طيب إن شاء الله we'll cover many aspects of the hadi and the guidance of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم throughout our class now the fiqh part which relates to the ruling concerning the fasting إن شاء الله I'm going to Uh, go through it and I'm going to concentrate on the uh, on the basics and inshallah later on we we'll have the session for question and answer inshallah we can go through more uh, details so the first point is who is required to fast who is required to fast every adult Muslim every adult Muslim of course male or female who is resident and able to fast. Okay, do we have to add uh, the word Muslim? Should we say every adult Muslim? Or we can say every adult sane, resident, and person who is able to fast. We have to include the word Muslim, right? Because non-Muslims are, are not required to fast, okay? Inshallah, we'll come to this point later on. So, who is required to fast? Every adult Muslim who is sane and resident at his hometown, meaning that he's not a traveler, and he's capable of fasting. يَسْتَطِيعُ الصَّوْمُ Okay, saying a Muslim, we excluded non-Muslims. Saying adults, we excluded children. 
saying resident, we excluded travelers. Capable of fasting, so we excluded people who are unable to fast. Whether it's owing to illness or being an elderly person or something like that. Okay, so those are the preconditions for fasting. Preconditions for fasting. Type the first condition, which is being a Muslim. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> will not accept deeds from anyone who is not a Muslim. وَمَا مَنَعَهُمْ أَن تُقْبَلَ مِنْهُمْ نَفَقَاتُهُمْ إِلَّا أَنَّهُمْ كَفَرُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ The only reason that Allah did not accept the nafaqa, the sadaqa, the charities provided by the hypocrite in al Medina. The only reason that they disbelieve in Allah and his messenger. So this is a well-established uh, principle that Allah will not accept any deed from anyone except he first fulfilled the condition of being a Muslim. But does this mean that disbelievers will not be punished or held accountable for not performing fasting and prayer and those deeds, they would be punished for that. They would be punished for being disbelieving in Allah. They would be punished for not praying. They would be punished for not fasting. They would be punished for not performing hajj, for not performing every single detail, every single rule, every single act that we are required to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرَ What caused you to be in hell? This is a question will be asked by the <coughs> keepers of the hell, to the people of hell. What caused you to enter hell? They were going to start, now they will start listing the things that brought them into hell. They said, قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ We were not among those who used to pray. So they're listing what brought them here, beside being disbelievers, that they were not among those who pray. قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ وَلَمْ نَكُمْ نُضْعِمُ الْمِسْكِينَ Nor do we use to feed the poor. وَكُنَّا نَخُوضُ مَعَ الْخَائِدِينَ We used to get involved in nonsense. وَكُنَّا نُكَذِّبُ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينَ And we used to deny the day of judgment, the day of a deen. And based on this, and according to the vast majority of the scholars, that the disbelievers will be called to account for the principles and also the minor issues. They will be held accountable for failure to pray, for failure to fast, for failure to, permit, to perform hajj. For, fair, for failure to tell the truth. Now, having said so, also the majority of the scholars, they said, it is prohibited during the months of Ramadan to sell food to non-believers. Because, yes, if they fasted, it will not be accepted from them. Okay, But they are not supposed to eat during the days of Ramadan. Okay? Because of that ayah. And this is the opinion of the majority of the scholars. That they will be held accountable for that. So, if you have a restaurant, then you are not supposed as a Muslim to sell ready-made food for people to eat it during the days of Ramadan, even if those people are non-believers. And this is something that, unfortunately, many people, you know, they are not aware about it. Many people who have businesses in this country or in the Muslim world country, they open their restaurants during the day of Ramadan and they sell food to non-believers, saying that, oh, it's not obligatory upon them to fast. Okay? And this is the opinion of the majority of the scholars. Unless, unless, if <clears throat> some type of harm will fall uh, the owner of that restaurant, if he did not open the doors of his restaurant during the day, this is another thing, okay? But if he can manage not to sell food, even for non-Muslims, during the days of Ramadan, those who will consume it during the days of Ramadan, then he should do so because of that. So being a Muslim and being an adult, adulthood means that when a child reaches the age of puberty, he becomes an adult and he is required 
to fast just like his father, just like every other adult Muslim. And adulthood is not reaching the age of 18. You know, adulthood, there are signs for adulthood. Some of those signs, for example, uh, the first sign, if that boy start ejaculation or seeing wet dreams, even if he's at the age of 10 or 11 or 12, he's an adult. And he's required to fast like everybody else. Okay? And also girls who start receiving menstruation. And a girl could become a woman or become an adult woman by the completion of the ninth year. This could happen. It's, it's seen uh, yeah, and many times and in many places. Okay? As early as the completion of its nine lunar year, she can become a woman. Okay, we as fathers, we have, we, have, we have to be aware about those things. Okay, another sign uh, for uh, puberty amongst boys and girls. If that child grew this hair around his private parts, the pubic hair, not growing a mustache, not having his voice becomes a little bit, you know, like adults, no. Growth, or growth of this hair around the private parts is another sign of adulthood. Another sign, if the child, boy or a girl, reads the age of 15 lunar years. If he reads the age of 15 lunar year, years, he is an adult. Whether he starts <coughs> ejaculation or whether he starts seeing with dreams or not, whether she sees, <coughs> excuse me, menstruation or not, as she or he reached the age of 15, 15 lunar years. He's an, oh, he or she is an adult, and <clears throat> they are required to fast like every other adult. So being a Muslim, adult, and sane, resident, because travelers are exempted from fasting. If someone is traveling <clears throat> during the month of Ramadan, he's exempted from fasting. And the fourth uh, <clears throat> thing is uh, being capable of fasting, because if he's incapable or if he is unable to fast, uh, for example, for an illness or the like, he will be exempted from fasting. Now, for adulthood, which is, of course, a condition and a prerequisite, <clears throat> does not mean that we should not encourage our children to fast. And the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they used to encourage their kids <clears throat> to fast, and they used to make toys stuffed with cotton. Okay? So whenever the child start crying, asking for food or out of hunger, they will give him a toy <clears throat> to get him busy until the time of breaking the fast, until the time of sunset. So it is highly recommended for fathers, for parents, and for mothers too, <clears throat> to encourage their children to fast, to encourage them uh, to fast. Type. So being an adult, being a saint, being uh, a resident, and also being capable of fasting. <clears throat> Type. Being capable to fast, we said, if someone is uncapable, uh, unable to fast because of an illness or because he's an elderly person, fasting is very hard for him. Those are the type of people who, are, who will be exempted from fasting. Now, illnesses, if someone is, a, is ill, then we have three <clears throat> types of people. If someone is, an, is ill and he's unable to fast, because fasting will pose or put him in hardship or it will hurt or harm him, then it would be preferred for him not to fast. But if it is a light illness and he can manage to fast, it won't delay his recovery. It won't present any type of hardship. Then it would be preferred for him to fast. If it causes some hardship, or a little bit of hardship, he's preferred to break his fast. But if there is no hardship, then it would be better for him to fast. Now, if fasting will delay his recovery, or hurt him, or <clears throat> put him in severe hardship, then of course, it is an obligation, obligation upon him to break his fast. So we have those three uh, levels type. Being a resident or muqim, meaning that if you are a traveler, 
you will be exempted from fasting. Now, the same thing applied to the traveler <clears throat> because we have many hadith. In some hadith that the Prophet وسلم, you know, broke his fast when he traveled. Some other hadith that he continued in his fasting even during travel. So the scholars based on all those hadith, they said also we have three levels. If traveling, you know, if fasting while you are, at, you are traveling will not cause hardship on you, then it's better for you to fast. If there is some hardship, you are preferred to break your fast. If extremely hard for you to fast while you are traveling, then you have to break your fast. And remember all the time, you know, if you decide it, or if fasting is not going to hurt you, it would be better to fast. Why? Because you will be fasting during the month of Ramadan, and we know the blessings and the reward of performing good deeds during the month of Ramadan. Secondly, that you will be fasting with everyone, okay? Otherwise, if you broke your fast, you might end up fasting those days by yourself. So it will be more encouraging for you to fast with everybody uh, else, okay? This is for the one who is traveling. Now, the one who, has, who is uh, uh, incapable of fasting because of his age or because he is permanently ill, he cannot fast, you know, and he's permanently, permanently ill, of course, he will be exempted from fasting, and instead, he would be required to feed a miskin for each day of Ramadan. So if Ramadan is 29 days, then he's required to feed 29 poor Muslims. If it's 30 days, he would be required to feed 30 Muslim miskins. Type. Another issue related with <clears throat> being capable to fast is pregnant, pregnant women or women who are breastfeeding or nurse their kids. If a, a pregnant woman is unable to fast because fasting is harmful to her and her child, for example, or her baby, then, you know, she will break her fast and later on she would be required only to make up those days, okay? The same thing is applied to a breastfeeding woman, but most likely a breastfeeding woman, she breaks the fast not for herself, but for the child. Now, if that is the case and she, uh, and she wanted to break the fast in order to have enough milk for the child, she can do that, but according to the stronger opinion of the scholars, that later on she would be uh, required to make up the, the days plus feeding a miskin in addition for every day that she broke the fast. Because she's not, she, she's not treated like someone who broke the fast because he is ill, okay? She did that for somebody else, to have more or enough milk for the child. And this is the opinion of the Shafi'i and the Hanbalis, based in a, a tradition or a hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas, that a pregnant woman or a breastfeeding woman, if she broke the fast out of fear for her baby, then she has to make up those days plus uh, feeding a skin for each day that she broke fasting in it. Taib, any questions so far about who should fast? For the rest. Can you repeat about the sick person? Taib, the three levels of a, an ill person, that an ill person, that if he fasts, Fasting would not be harmful for him, okay? Then it, it would be preferred for him to fast, okay? Now, if fasting will cause a little hardship, but still he can manage to fast, it would be preferred for him not to fast. But if fasting will delay his recovery or put him in extreme or severe hardship, then he is required to break his fast, okay? So those are the three levels of an ill person and fasting. Type the niyyah or the intention for the fasting. As we know that every single act of worship 
needs a need, need intention. And intention is a condition of one's heart. So the person should have this intention in his heart that he would be fasting the months of Ramadan. You need only the intention, you know, the night before the first day. You don't have to have this intention every day because it is one continuous ibadah. If you have it, like for example, the night before the first day, that's it. Unless if someone interrupted his fasting due to an illness or, a tra or traveling, then he has to resume the intention again. But as I said, the intention must be made before Fajr prayer, okay? It has to be before Fajr prayer. The intention is valid during any part of the night. Type also another issue, it, it, it need not be spoken, you know. In fact, speaking one's intention is an act of bid'ah, it's an innovation. Because intention is the condition of one's heart. You don't have to speak to your condition. Allah knows what's in your heart. Okay. Now, conditional intention. Like, for example, if someone, you know, he needs to go to bed early. Okay. And sometimes the news for Ramadan might come late. 11 or 12 o'clock and he went to bed with the intention that if tomorrow is the first day of Ramadan then I would be fasting is this considered to be a valid intention if someone has intention like that like before because he's unsure whether tomorrow is the first day of Ramadan or not so he went to bed with that intention if tomorrow is the first day of Ramadan then I would be fasting In the morning time he went to the masjid and he asked the brother, they said, yes, today is the first day of Ramadan. Can he just continue fasting with that intention? Or you think because he's hesitant, this is not, he should not, that, that will not be acceptable. You know, such type of conditional, uh, conditional intention is acceptable. Okay? This is called ta'liq al -niyya. Ta'liq al -niyya means to have a conditional uh, intention. So it's, it's okay to do that. If someone, you know, want to go to bed early, but the news for Ramadan, you know, is not yet, then he can do that. He can just go to bed with that intention in his heart, and he, when he wakes up in the morning, if he found out that today is the first day of Ramadan, then he should continue the fasting, and that will be acceptable. Yeah, this is a conditional niya. Type. Type. Those who are permitted to break the fast, but who must be a fidya. As I mentioned, anyone who is permanently ill or terminally ill, someone who is not expected to recover, to recover from his illness, or an elderly person who reached an age that it would be very hard for him to fast, he would be exempted from fasting, but he would be required to feed one miskin, one Muslim miskin, for each day of Ramadan. For each day of Ramadan. Now, feeding the miskins, he can do it day by day, or he can wait, for example, for a couple days, for example, a week, then feed six, seven people, or he can wait for 15 days, and then feed uh, 15 uh, people, or he can wait until the end of the month, and then he can feed 29 or 30 people, okay? He can choose whatever easier for him. This, as I said, for elderly men and women, for chronically or terminally ill people, they are allowed to do that. Now, making up the missed days of fasting. If someone is not terminally ill, but during the month of Ramadan, he, was, he has some type of illness, and then later on he recovered. Of course, he is required to make up the days that you know, he broke his fast during the month of Ramadan. وَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ He has to make up those days. And he is required to make up those days before the arrival of next Ramadan. If he fails to do so, he committed a sin. Because he delayed making up the days, you know, after the arrival of the other Ramadan. But... After, he's also required, of course, to do it even after that, but he has to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that sin. He is not supposed to delay making up those days without excuse until the arrival of the coming Ramadan. So if someone, this is a quiz, 
if someone was sick during the month of Ramadan, for example, he missed the last 10 days of Ramadan, okay? And this sickness continued with him until he passed away. So what would happen to those 10 days? Should his family members make up those days on, behalf, on his behalf or not? If he was sick, and this sickness or illness continued with him until he passed away, is it still obligatory upon his family members to make up those days for him? Yes, no? So what if he missed 10 days, then he recovered after that, but later on he died before making up those days? Now this is another scenario. So for the first scenario, if illness continued until he passed away, you know, he's, 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 no, you know, those days should not be made up, you know, because the illness continued, the order, the excuse continued until his death. But if he recovered and had ample time to make the, up those days and he failed to do that, then, you know, then his ears, those who inherit him among his relatives, are required to make up those days for him. Why? Because he had an opportunity to make up the fast, fasting and he failed to do it. Okay? But anyhow, for an ill person, or a sick person who broke the fast during days of the month of Ramadan. Because of that, he is required to perform or to make up those days before the coming Ramadan. Now, Fadl. Al Wali, Fadl. Now, it's preferred to be performed by you know his close relatives. Okay. If none of them wanted to do that, even a friend can do that for him. And if a friend can perform that. For example, if he missed like 10 days, okay? Now one person can perform the 10 days, or 10 people can perform, each one make one day, okay? I prefer you know, to, to be among his, his, his awliya, his family members. If not, then any friend or any Muslim brother can do that. Okay, if all of them fail to do that, then they can resort to feeding, you know, either from his, uh, what he left behind or someone volunteered to do uh, and pay for that. If even they cannot do that, then he will be pardoned and exempted. Okay, طيب. طيب. He was sick the entire month of Ramadan. Yes. And then he recovered after that. Yes. He recovered and he had an ample time <clears throat> to make up the days, but he failed to, he failed to do it. Right. <clears throat> and he died before doing that, of course. And, but what about if he's alive? I know, no, 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 no. He has to make it up. If he's still alive, of course he has to make up those days. Okay? Now if something happened to him and he wasn't able to make up those days, permanently, then he can resort to feeding. Okay? طيب. طيب. What are the practices that <coughs> breaks one's, break one's fast? There are certain things mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu will break one's fast. Okay? For the Quran, only three things mentioned. Only three things mentioned. <coughs> Eating, Drinking and sexual intercourse. This was mentioned in one ayah, which says, huh? means having sexual relations with one's wife. Means, <laughs> حتى يتبين لكم الخيط الأبيض من الخيط الأسود من الفيل. So the ayah mentioned two, three things: sexual intercourse, eating and drinking. Those three acts mentioned in the Quran, and they will break one's fast, <coughs> and agreed upon by all the scholars. There is no disagreement amongst the scholars concerning those things. But there are other issues concerning which 
there are disagreement among the scholars. Okay. طيب نقول إن شاء الله تقول سو زوس إيشوز. طيب. Now before that, if someone broke his fast by eating and drinking, he would be required to make up that day. First of all, he has to repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. If someone intentionally and for no excuse ate or drank during the days of Ramadan for no valid excuse, he committed a major sin. So what he should do first, he should repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Secondly, he has to make up this day. Thirdly, he cannot say, "Okay, I already drank, so I'm going to continue eating and drinking." He has to stop eating and drinking right away. تعظيما لحرمة هذا الشهر. And this also agreed upon by all the scholars. If someone intentionally broke his fast, he is not allowed to continue drinking and eating during the from. He cannot say, "Oh, I already broke my day, broke the fast of that day." No, he is required to stop eating and drinking. Even that day is not counted, and he has to make it up. And before that, he has to repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. طيب. This is for someone who ate or drank during the days of Ramadan intentionally, knowingly, without any excuse. طيب. The one who uh, uh, has sexual intercourse with his wife during the days of Ramadan, knowingly, intentionally, he has to do many things. First of all, he has to repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Okay, this is a major sin. Secondly, he has to make up this day. Thirdly, there is a, there is a, a, a kafara that has to be performed. He has to fast two consecutive months. Two consecutive months, and if his wife voluntarily joined him, if he forced her, you know that will not affect her fast. But if he If he, both of them, do it uh, knowingly, intentionally, both of them are required to do the kafara, which is fasting two months. And this is only if he or she broke their fast by having sexual intercourse. But if he broke his fast by intentionally eating or drinking, according to the majority of the scholars, and this is the stronger opinion, he only need to repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and make up that day. So there is no kafara. In case if he broke his fast by eating and drinking, the kafara is only if he had sexual relation with his wife. So we said eating and drinking. What about smoking? Cigarette smoking. We all know that it is a prohibited action. It is haram, whether in Ramadan or other than Ramadan. But smoking during the days of Ramadan definitely breaks one's fast. It will break. Once fast, and this is the by the agreement of almost all the contemporary scholars, they agreed that smoking, cigarette smoking, will nullify once fasting. Okay. Type another issue, but this issue is a, <clears throat> a controversial issue among the scholars is if someone caused himself to vomit or to throw up. Okay, because there's a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. قال من من ذرعه القي فلا قضاء عليه ومن استقاف عليه القضاء the one who out of his control vomit or throw up there is no قضاء for him and his fast is okay and correct and he should continue fasting and there is no قضاء there is no he does not have to make up that day okay but if someone causes himself to vomit then his fast is over that day is not counted. And he has to make up that day, okay? Because of that hadith. طيب, willful ejaculation by means of kissing or you know uh, anything like that, or uh, you know even without having a, a sexual intercourse, if someone intentionally did an act that caused him to ejaculate, this will invalidate his fast. His fast will be invalid, and he has to repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and make up this day. But there is no kafara here. The kafara is only if he had sexual relation with his wife, 
okay? Again, if someone caused himself to ejaculate, like for example, masturbating, okay? Which is haram in Ramadan or other than Ramadan. But if, it ha if he did that during the days of Ramadan, this will invalidate his fast. He has to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he has to make up this day. طيب. Another thing which is agreed upon that will invalidate one's fast, and this is for women, is to having menstruation. Once the woman had menstruation, then her fast is over. And it is haram, prohibited for her to continue fasting. Okay, and this is well established by the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam that women during menstruation are prohibited from fasting. Type if one had the intention or intended to break his fast, but he did not break his fast, like he intended to drink or to eat, and he went, for example, to the kitchen, but he cannot find any food to eat. Then he decided, okay, let me continue fasting. Is that acceptable? You know, intention is very important. For each and every ibadah, you have to have the intention from the beginning to the end of that ibadah. Interruption of the intention will invalidate the ibadah. Like if someone in the middle of the salah intended to break the salah, his salah is over. Okay? If he intended to break his fast, his fast is over. Even if he did not eat anything. Because hukm mustashab and niya that we should that you should you should have your intention without being interrupted throughout the ibadah, any ibadah. Okay, so if he intended not intended to break his fast, now even if he did not eat or drink, his fast is over. What's meant by intention here? Intention is very important. You know, I'm not talking about someone who is thinking. You know, someone who intended. Because, you know, from when you have an idea crosses your mind until you act, there are many levels. The first level that the, the idea struck your mind, you start thinking about it. I'm not talking about this. This is not intention. This is called khatir. Then you start talking to yourself, or he start talking to himself, should I break my fast or not? This is also not intention. Okay, it's called hadith al nafs. And the Prophet says, Inna Allah tajawaz an ummati ma haddathat bihi anfusaha ma lam tatahaddath, aw ta'amal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardoned my ummah about things like that. For things like that, like, you know, talking to oneself. If he is not intended to do, to act, or if he did not say anything or do anything okay but once he start developing an intention he de developed an intention now he intended to break the fast now even if he did not break the fast his fast is over because he should keep his intention throughout the fasting throughout the ibadah without interrupting this intention type those things that I had mentioned, those practices, will break one's fast, providing that four conditions are fulfilled. Those conditions are that to do those acts knowingly, that he do it knowingly. If someone is ignorant about any of those as being uh, nullifiers for fasting, this will not nullify his fasting. Example, like if a new Muslim, you know, thinks that having a relation with one's wife will not break his fast during the day. He's a new Muslim, okay? Then even if he had relation with his wife, this will not nullify his fasting. Why? Because those things will nullify one's fasting if it is done knowingly. That the person know that this act will nullify his fast, okay? Secondly, done intentionally. If it's done out of forgetfulness, for example, or non-intentional, it won't break one fast. So if someone, for example, especially uh, within the first few days of Ramadan, if he forgot and he drank water, okay? Or, you know, something that happened out of his control, 
like he was making wudu and then he rinsed his mouth and water get into his body you know non-intentional it will not break his fast okay not out of forgetfulness as i mentioned if he forgot and drank for example during the days of ramadan this will not nullify his fast it will not nullify his fast and the fourth thing if he do it willingly willingly means without being compelled to do it okay if someone compels him to break the fast or as i said water get into his body out of his control he just making wudu rinsing his mouth and he you know swallowed the water out of his control then you know this will not affect his fast so all those things that i mentioned as practice that would break one's fast if it's done unknowingly non-intentionally uh, not our out of forgetfulness and not willingly it will not affect one's fast type if he broke his fast by sexual intercourse as i mentioned first he has to do four things he must first uh, repent to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay Secondly, he should make up that day. <coughs> Thirdly, he has to do the kafara. And the kafara, as mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the least or the thing that we can do now is to fast uh, uh, two months. If he cannot do that, then he would feed 60 miskins. 60 miskins for that day because of breaking his fast uh, uh, having sexual intercourse with his wife and it was mentioned in an authentic hadith that a man came to the Prophet وسلم, saying I did a great thing I broke my fast I had relation with my wife and the Prophet وسلم, له, free a slave he said I don't have and then he said fast two consecutive months he said I can't do that it's very hard for me to do that Okay, I'm not capable to do that then he told him, feed 60 miskins. Okay, those are the things that should be done as an act of kafara for someone who broke his fast because of having sexual relation with his wife. This is in brief, some of the basic rules uh, related to the fasting, inshallah. If you have any question about what we had mentioned or any other question related to fasting, inshallah, you can go ahead and ask the questions. Yes. We were talking about the person who, uh, for reason or another, could not fast in our land for reason or another, two days or maybe out of the month or maybe the ten days of the month. And the other mother comes and he or she did not make up those days. Hmm. She did not, or he, as the Ghana just said, uh, make up those days that he that he eat during the first Ramadan. Mm. Then maybe the same thing happened with her or with him on the next Ramadan. So by then, the person has accumulation of days that he did not make up and he needs to, but he could not. Fine. Is there any other way he has to fast those days? Or can he, any other kafar, can he, for example, feed the assistance? The concept of kafara, kafara is only if someone broke his fast by having sexual relation with his wife. Okay, and the kafara is to feed. I'm sorry, to fast two consecutive months or to feed sixty miskins. Okay. Now, if someone broke his fast for any other reason, like intentionally, knowingly ate during the days of Ramadan. He committed a major sin. He has to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make up for those days. Now, if someone has an accumulation of days, and a good example for that, like a woman during the month was pregnant. Then afterwards, she delivered. So she breast her uh, child. Okay, and this continued for the second year. And then after that, she became pregnant again. And then she accumulated many days is there is any way for her, you know, other than fasting? No. You know, she can, like, for example, she has like 90 days or 120 days. She should try to do 
those days, okay? Like for example, three days each month or five days each month until she's able to finish all those days. It is a requirement to make up those days. But if later on failed to make up the days because of uh, being unable to do it too fast for a permanent illness or something like that, then she would feed a miskin for each day. But as long as she can fast, she is required to fast. Now, now mm. Huh? Yeah, yeah, uh, he's referring to the ayah that says yeah, Fast and prayers and zakah and other basic ibadat were prescribed to the nations before us But it is not the same fasting like ours as also like their prayers are not the same prayers like ours Their prayers also has ruku and sujood Allah says Ya Maria muqnuti li rabbiki wasjudi warka'i ma'al raka'in They have a prayer, Allah commanding Mary, uh, Maryam, the mother of Jesus, alayhi salam, to, to, to make ruku' and sujood. But it's different than our prayers. Okay, we pray five times a day. For example, we pray maghrib, si raka'at, fayyid, tu raka'at, a specific type of prayers. Nations before us, they have prayers. They have fasting. They pay the ka, okay? But it's different than, than ours. Now, yes. I mean, should a person make, I mean, if a person is capable of making a fast, should they make the fast? Or if, for, for example, a sister will miss a couple of days okay. of fasting, is she required to make up the fast if she's capable to? Or can she pay? No, no, no. She has to make the fast. Exactly. Well, I mean, the question I, w I wanted to ask is that, what about the sister, she missed a couple of days and then she become pregnant. Okay. And and then she after that, pregnant. okay. She can make up the fast. It will be no harm for her, but it will be harm for the baby. So, but, what is, what would you Taib, you know, if she consulted a trustworthy Muslim doctor, mm -hmm. and he told her fasting is harmful to you and your baby, she can break the fast. Yeah, yeah. Or if they told her it's, it will not be harmful, to you, but it be harmful uh, to the baby. She also has to break her fast. Now, the difference between the two, if it's harmful for her, then later on she's only required to make up those days. But if it is harmful for the baby, because now she's breaking her fast not for herself, okay, for her baby. If that is the case, yes, she can break the fast, but later on she has to make the days and also feed a skin for every day. If if there is a Muslim trustworthy doctor knows about fasting and the rules of fasting, and he told her you cannot fast, then halas she cannot fast. If there is no Muslim doctor available, any other doctor, she should just explain to him what type of fasting we're doing. I'm sorry, I missed it. If hmm. if the doctor tell her that it is harm for her. Yeah. And the next Ramadan, does she have to make it or she has to... No, no, she has to make those days whenever she is able to do so. Like if she delivered the baby and become pure and she can now make up those days, then she should do them, make them up before the coming Ramadan. And, she, and, and she has to pay too? Or she... If she broke the fast because fasting is harmful to her, right. there is no fidya. This is called fidya. Feeding the, mis the miskins is called fidya. She is not required to pay fidya, only making up those days. But if she broke the fast because of her child, then she has to uh, break, uh, yeah, make up the days and pay the fidya. Yes. One more question. Yes. Question about, you said there is, uh, you have to have the intention, but the intention, you make the intention. You have to have intention every time you fast, and also the idea about support. That there's no support. There's no fasting about support. Is this correct? There's no fasting. But support, support. Support. Is there a hadith that indicates that you have to have support? Not you. You don't have. You have to. Support is highly recommended because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in an authentic hadith, hadith Anas, قال تسحر فإن في السحور بركة. Take the bread on meal, support, because there is a blessing in it. Even if you are full, you you don't you are not hungry. Just wake up and just take a sip of water, one dead, to get the blessing of the sahur. 
and this is is a recommendation from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Sahaba used to make suhoor all the time. Okay, it's highly recommended to take the meal, the bread on suhoor. I'm sorry? Okay. I, I'm sorry, intention, intention for what? Yes, count it as intention. You know, if today is the last night of day of Sha'ban, okay, and we saw the moon, and then you went home, you prepared your sahur and put it aside, this is your intention. You know, intention that your heart is conditioned for the day, that tomorrow is the uh, first day of Ramadan. You don't have to say, Nawaitu an asuma shahar Ramadan. No. As long as you know that in your heart you're going to fast tomorrow by you know doing preparation for your sahur and things like that, then that will be considered as an intention. So I need someone, inshallah, to read those uh, questions. Yes, raise your voice. Is it considered an exception of the rule for Muslims to serve food during Ramadan if they will suffer financial harm? For example, if they have a family business. Hmm. Taib, I will answer this question, but before that, there is a very important issue. We have to understand one fact, that for a Muslim to live amongst Muslims, it's okay. But there is a basic condition need to be fulfilled, that you would be able to observe your deen. يكون قادرا على إقامة ديني. All the requirements of deen that you you will be able to do it. Okay? Now, if you are unable to do that, what should you do? Move. Ardullahi wasi'ah. A group of Muslims who did not migrate from Mecca to Al Madina. Okay? And they went with the kuffar and they were killed in the battlefield. Allah says about them, in the ladina tawafahum al malaika. ظالمي أنفسهم قالوا فيما كنتم قالوا كنا مستضعفين في الأرض قالوا ألم تكن أرض الله واسعة فتهاجروا فيها The land of Allah is white So migrate Okay We should have this fact all the time present In our hearts and minds That we are only allowed To live among non-believers Only if we are able to establish our deen If you reach a point where you cannot uh, practice your deen. Your wife cannot practice her deen. Your children cannot practice their deen. Then you don't, have, you don't have an excuse to stay. Not because you have a business or have this or that. Okay? Many people, they ask me, brother, I got that job. And that job I have to sell alcohol or to sell bulk or things like that. You know? This is a question from someone who does not have that fact present in his mind. Okay? If you are unable to practice your deen, then this is not, not only applied here, anywhere over the, in, in, the, in the face of the earth, okay? Now, if someone establish a business here, okay? And if he close the doors of that business during the month of Ramadan, that might bring an imminent harm. Not, you know, he speculate or speculation that something might happen to him. Losing money is not considered to be uh, a major disaster. Okay, because he can work during the night. Try to compensate, you know, for that. But if this uh, franchise b uh, business and he cannot close it, otherwise he's going to lose the entire business, this could be an excuse. Okay, but at the same time, we have to have that fact present in our minds that if I am unable to practice my deen, to follow all the obligations of my deen, then I should not stay in this place. Move from this state to another state, from this city to another city, from this country to another country. Okay? Because, you know, we are allowed to live among non believers only if we are able to fulfill the requirements of our deen. Wallahu ta'ala. Ta Does fasting sunnah days also count towards fasting days missed during Ramadan? No. Because you need to have an intention. You need to have an intention that, for example, if someone missed days, the night before making up those days, he has to have the intention that he would be fasting those missed days of Ramadan. Yeah. You said that if someone has a restaurant, uh, it's supposed not mm. to sell ready, uh, ready for non-believers in month of Ramadan. But in Muslim countries like my country, Egypt, in all the day of Ramadan, all the restaurants 
Al-Obah. sell foods for all Muslims people and non-Muslims because we have a lot of Christians in Egypt. Exactly what happens, in, unfortunately, in many Muslim countries. But it's not right. This is wrong. This is wrong. And this is the opinion of the majority of the scholars. Go and check what the Imam al nawi say about that. And he, uh, he mentioned the opinion of other madhabs, not only the Shafi'i madhab, that during the days of Ramadan is prohibited. And they used to give the example, if you have a servant who is a non-Muslim working at your home, should you feed him during the days of Ramadan? Should you present food to him during the days of Ramadan, even if he's a cafe? They say no. Okay? If you have a restaurant, you should not sell food that would be consumed even by non-believers during the days of Ramadan. Now. كيف أميز بين المسكين والفقير؟ ومن هو المسكين والفقير؟ هل هناك فرق بينهما؟ طيب. The difference between the miskin and the fakir. Inshallah, we'll answer it first in Arabic because the question is in Arabic. The difference between the miskin and the fakir. They said that the miskin is the one who does not have anything. Or the one who is able to cover half of his needs. But not more than half. That means that he does not have anything. Or he does not have anything. نصف ما يحتاج إليه والمسكين هو الذي عنده شيء لكنه لا يستطيع أن يغطي كل حاجته وكلاهما الفقير والمسكين يمكن أن يدفع لهم الطعام الذي هو الفدية في, في, في شهر رمضان So question is about what is the difference between مسكين and فقير مسكين is the one the فقير is the one who can, does not have anything or he can barely cover up to 50% of his basic needs the miskin is the one who has something, but he is unable to cover 100% of his basic needs. He can cover 60% or 70%, but not 100% of his basic needs. And both of them, you can give them your fidya. Okay? And both of them are uh, recipient or entitled to receive the zakah too. إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ Both of them are entitled for that. Okay. Are those the questions? Yeah, same for the answer. Yeah, the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chef, um, mm. that's, 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 then he is required to feed them one miskin for each day. If he cannot do that either, right? Khalas, he would be pardoned. He would be pardoned. There is no other substitute. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ And uh, the Prophet ﷺ says, إِذَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِأَمْرٍ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُمْ اسْتَطَعْتُمْ If he cannot feed, he does not have money because he's poor, then of course he would be exempted even from that. Okay? For the love of Allah. One of the uh, major issues that you uh, talked about, Sheikh, was the moon sighting. Okay. And what is uh, around the uh, Ummah today in regards to moon sighting. So let's say, like, for example, a Saudi is like seven, eight hours ahead of us. So let's say if they were to see the moon, but in our local <coughs> area, we were unable to see the moon, like because of clouds or we were unable to see. So in this situation, what would we do? Would we follow them? Because to follow, like, uh, to be uh, followed as one Ummah, okay. or do we follow by um, local, uh, locality? Time. Barakallah. Uh, this is a, a very known issue that should we go globally or locally regarding the sighting of the moon? And these are two valid opinions, and even during the time of the Sahaba, those two opinions were present. Some of them, they, they thought that it would be better to go locally, that every region has its own citation. Some other Sahaba's opinion that no, we should go globally. فمن شهد منكم شهر فليصوم كتب عليكم الصوم. Is that all the ayat address the entire ummah? And this opinion seems to be stronger than the other opinion. Especially nowadays, you know the news. You know we can get the new the news very fast. Okay, in a fraction of a second we can know whether you know the moon is sighted anywhere in the Muslim world. 
So this seems to be the more, يعني, more, more stronger or stronger than the other opinion that says going locally. But if like the people, the Muslim brothers, the Muslim people in America, all of them agreed to go locally, then we can follow and go because it's a valid opinion, even though it's not a stronger opinion. Okay. Now those are the two valid opinions, either to go locally or globally. And going globally is more uh, st or stronger. Okay. But, you know, leaving both and go by calculation, now this opinion has no basis in the Sharia. Okay. And this is again is the ijma of the Sahaba and the Tabi'in and all the Imams. You know, calculations were known or known at the time of the Prophet When he says, نَحْنُ أُمَّةُ لَا نَكْتِبُ وَلَا نَحْسِبُ He's referring to the Jews tribes who lived in al Medina because they used to have to, to write their calendars. You know, they go by calculation and they write a calendar for the whole year about the times of the beginning of each lunar month. It is known at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, okay? But he said, no, we don't, we are not for that, okay? If you see the moon, then fast. And if you see the second time at the end of the month, then you should break your fast. Okay, In, for sighting, yes, we can go globally or we can go locally, but globally seems to be stronger. Now, yes? Uh, when you say locally, is this like... America or like, for instance, Northern Virginia or like your western? No, no, locally means a region that shares the day or night with you. It's not like a city by city or a state by state. Like, because one time, a western, they, they had like, they, they passed it the day after like all the other western, or like a certain group of western passed out like one day after, two days after, and you happen to be back at the western. Like and they started the moon. The moon was. You know, well, like, what does something else? For example, it's, it's, uh, ah, okay, they're going by calculations. No, I said, you know, calculation is not a proper means for. All like that at the same time. Like if they said we're going to go locally, okay? And they get the news of the citation of the moon, for example, from, from Ohio. There's no problem, you know, they can go by that. But I, I think it would be uh, yeah, preferable to go uh, globally, okay? Because at the time of the Sahaba, it's very hard to get the news, for example, from Syria to Medina. It takes like weeks for the news to... But nowadays, you know, it is very easy, you know, and it can spread of a second, we can have, we can spread the news all over the world. Now, yes, this young boy. Uh, what if someone can't fast one day and he's four, so he can't? <laughs> he's four years old? No, like, uh. if someone's going there and he can't manage to fast that day and he can't give anything. He's poor. Okay. Someone who is poor, he wasn't able to fast. He's an, he's an elderly person. He's exempted from fasting, but he's required to feed a poor person. But he, is, he himself is poor, and he does not have means or wealth or money to, uh, to feed a poor person, right? What should he do? He will be exempted. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Okay? And he would be pardoned. Okay? Now, yes? Um, my next one is to ask uh, if um, the time of the person uh, in the state of health, he's sick and then he gets better and then he dies. You said his, his relatives can make it up. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, for those days he missed, multiple relatives make it up? Yeah, if like 10 days, maybe 10 people, each one of them fast one day, or five people, each one fast two days, or it, yeah, or one person, five those 10 days. All of that is acceptable. Okay? Yeah, one person fast the 10 days, or 10 people, each one fast one day, or five people, each one fast two days. This is acceptable. Or each of one of those is acceptable. Okay? No. Um, so, uh, why is uh, 
the moonsighting act of worship different than other acts of worship for us globally versus locally. So if one would uh, use a, a global moon sighting for their act of worship, why couldn't they change the Salah times for their act of worship? Because another person in another area, area prays Fajr at some time or Asr at some time, why couldn't they use that same philosophy for that act of worship? Taib, very good question. The question, I just rephrase your question. If we are allowed to use calculations to determine the times of the Salah, why not use it to determine the beginning of the month? Is this your question? Um, well, because you know those calendars, like this one here, it's based on calculation. Hmm. It's calculation. So why the scholars agreed that we can use calculations to prepare the times of the Salah for years. But when it comes to the moon sighting, we have all this. You know, arguments. Why? And fasting and prayer are all of them act of worship. Okay? There's a big difference between fasting and prayer. First of all, you know, for determination of the timing of the prayers, Allah says, Aqim is salata li duluk is shams. I'm sorry. Now, if you know duluk is shams, when the sun moves from the middle of the sky towards the, towards the west, this is called duluk is shams. It's called duluk, you know. Because at that time, when you look to, to the sun, you need to, this is called dalk, okay? And the Prophet says, وَقْتُ الْمَغْرِبْ إِذَا وَجَبَتْ الشمس. There is no ru'ya here, there is no sighting. If you know by any means that the sun moved from its zenith, okay? Or if you know by any means that the sun had set, then you should pray, okay? So, Regarding the times of the prayers, there is no citation. And also the Prophet says, وَقْتُ الظُّهْرِ مَا لَمْ يصل ظِلُّ الشَّيْءِ مثله. You know, when the length of the shadow the, of, the, of an object becomes exactly the same like the length of the object, then this is the end of Zuhr and the beginning of Asr time. Okay? So by any means, if you can determine the beginning of the Salah, you are okay. But for the fasting, the Prophet says, if you see the crescent, if you see the hilal, then start fasting. And if you see the hilal, the next time, which is at the end of the month, then you break your fast. Okay? So it is clearly talking about citation. Citation means to see it with your eyes. Okay, but for the salah, what's required is to know the time of the salah. And this is why the scholars, when they talk about the prerequisites of the Salah, they said one of the prerequisites of the Salah, the knowledge that the time of the Salah has begun. The knowledge. If you know that this is the time of Dhuhr, using calculation, putting stick and watch the, the measure the, uh, the shadow by any means, then you have to do the Salah. But for the fasting, all the ahadiths talking about ra'aytumuhu, if you see it. Okay, if you see it. Naam Allah Ta'ala. So there is a difference. Yes, we are allowed to have calendars using calculation for the entire year or for years about the salah, and no one of the scholars objected against that. But for the moon sighting, no. There's another difference. You know, the times of the prayer depends on, on the motion of the of the sun, right? And even in the physics, it's known that the motion of the earth around the sun is very predictable, okay? But the motion or the, the, the rotation of the moon around the earth is not predictable. And by the way, all the models, there is no algorithm to calculate, for example, the, the time of moon set and uh, moon rise accurately. It's models made based on observations like you know they collected the observation in different observatory centers for 100 years okay and then from this information they built a model and they use that model to predict the time of moon set and sun uh, and, and moon and moon rise okay and they even by 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 the mission of the astronomers they said there is a degree of uncertainty there is a degree of, of error but while for calculating the times of, of uh, the prayers, 
you know, the, 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 the degree of certainty is higher than uh, uh, calculation, the moon calculation. But anyhow, you know, for the prayers, yes, we are allowed to make calculation. This is why no objected, no one objected against using or using the uh, the calculation for the prayers. But for the moon sighting, it is it is based on sighting, <coughs> and this is why we have you know the majority of the scholars were against this issue that using calculation instead of physically seeing the crescent. Now, what is the ruling on uh, starting? The fast, um, I, on some different opinions I heard, you have to stop. Stop. The, you have to start the fast on the first ayah, and then others I heard on the second ayah, uh, uh, Salat al Fajr, and another I heard that if you're holding, I guess you're a drink or something, and you hear that ayah, then you're supposed to be recommended to finish what you're drinking. What Allah says in the Quran, فَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ means that you are allowed to eat and drink until dawn is in. Once dawn is in, then you should have to stop eating and drinking. Okay? Now, if, say, dawn is at, say, 4.20, okay? 4.20 exactly, you have to stop eating. Now, if you have something in your mouth, then you have to spit it out. You cannot, you cannot swallow it. But if it's only already gone, then of course you know it's out of your control and you, know, you don't have to to throw it up you know but if something you're chewing something on your mouth and the time is in then of course you have you have to spit it out you cannot continue Allah says Hatta yatabayin, until you are sure that dawn is in once dawn is in then you are not allowed to to eat anymore now so is that the same as like let's say when you're making wudu like you have a little saliva left should you kind of spit that out too as your mouth dry? No, no, no. The saliva, you know, you don't have to do that. If you swallow the saliva, that's okay. And no one, no scholar said, you know, it, you know, uh, swallowing your saliva will break your fast. Okay? Type any more questions? Question. Uh. Now here, is it okay to have Taraweeh for 8 and 20? Some days we do 8, some days we do 20. No problem? Type, type. طيب الأصل في ذا the يعني the rule regarding that it's highly recommended not to exceed eleven ركعات okay because عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها said the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم never exceeded eleven ركعات during Ramadan or other than Ramadan okay but this does not mean that you cannot pray more than eleven ركعات because a man came to ask the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم عن صلاة الليل قال صلاة الليل مثنى مثنى he asked him about the night prayer and the Prophet ﷺ told him, the night prayer is to pray two and two and two. If there is any limit, then the Prophet ﷺ would have told him not to exceed that. Okay? So the general rule, you can pray as many rak'at as you want. You can pray 20 rak'at. You can pray 36 rak'at if you want to. Okay? But it would be better not to exceed 11 rak'at, including taraweeh and with prayer. Okay? That will be preferred. But if you come to a masjid and they're praying 20 rak'at, it would be better to pray with them the 20 rak'at. No. No. And some scholars like Sheikh Al-Wasamir says, the Imam also have the choice. If he sees that people cannot stand long recitation, 12 rak'at would be hard for them. They prefer to have 20 short rak'at. Then he can do that. Okay, because it's not haram to pray more than 11 rak'at. It's only recommended to limit yourself to those 11 rak'at. But if the Imam decided, you know, people, you know, many elderly people, it's very hard for them to pray, you know, 11 long rak'at, it would be even better to pray like 12, less you know, short rak'at, 20 short rak'at, that would be also acceptable. Yeah. One last question. We're trying to do Kamalayl during the month of Shabbat. What is the best way to do it? I know you can announce it or, or select certain days. Qiyam al-Layl in general is a prayer that's supposed to be performed individually, with one exception, during the month of Ramadan. Another exception, if someone joined you in your night prayer, but is not pre, uh, huh? pre-planned. Like, for example, you visited the brother, you're spending the night with him. When he wakes up in the middle of the night to pray, then you joined him. But not pre-planned, like, you know, the tenths of Shaban, we're going to have 
uh, a night prayer or Qiyam al-Layl in this masjid or that masjid. This is, this is uh, against the Hadi, the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Never happened at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What happened that Ibn Abbas once spent the night at his aunt Maimuna's house, which is the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he walks up Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to pray, he joined him. It's not pre-planned. It happened like that. This is acceptable. But to make announcement, you know, this day or that day, we're going to pray Qiyamul Layl in Jama'ah. This is not the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Last question, Shaykh. About Qunud. Okay. We don't have to do Qunud in every, every night, right? Yeah, but it's recommended to make Qunud in Witr prayer, whether during Ramadan or in other days other than Ramadan. Okay? But you don't have to. You don't have to. It's not an obligation. It's only recommended. No. For the qunut, it is a dua. Okay? We have to be reasonable. Okay? I will ask you a question. Which is better? To make your dua in the qunut or in sujood? In sujood, right? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as for the sujood, exert your effort to make the dua. Now you see people, they're doing opposite. They make very fast sujood. You can barely say, Subhana Rabbi Ala once. You say, Allah Akbar. And when it comes to the qunud, in some masjid, 45 minutes qunud. Okay? It's better to make longer sujood, to make dua in it, than making longer qunud. But anyhow, yani you have to be reasonable. It should not be يعني, that long. So, you know, and many people, Allah, many people, they come and complain to me, you know, that, you know, the Imam made very long qunud. Okay? We have to be يعني, uh, reasonable in, in those things. Allah Ta'ala Yes? Yeah, does uh, toothpaste break your fast? No. You know, if you cleanse your mouth thoroughly, then you are okay, inshallah. Mouthwash, it won't affect your fast. What about inhalers? Inhalers for those who have rub, uh, uh, which is uh, asthma. Is it okay? Well, like the contemporary scholars, they, they have two different opinions. Some scholars, they said it won't affect one fast. Based on that, you know, they said it's only like air that goes through, you know, the air passage. But it tends to be, no, there is a medication in it. And some of that medication will reach the stomach. Many doctors, they said, yes, this is a fact. Maybe 80 or 60 percent of that uh, uh, air is, in fact, is like a, some sort of medication that will end up entering one's stomach. And they said, for that reason, if he needed to do so, then he will be exempted from the fasting. If he need to do that every day, he will be treated like someone who is te terminally ill. He need only to feed uh, people, and he should he should he should break his fast if he need to use it during the days of Ramadan all the time. Allah Taala. Do you donate blood? To Taib, those who said hijama breaks one fast. It's a controversial issue. According to the majority of the scholars, hijama you know cubbing to draw blood from one's body. According to the majority of scholars, it will not nullify one's fasting. According to Madhab al-Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, it will break one fast. So those who said it will break the fast, they said you cannot donate blood. And if you needed to do so, then you should break your fast and donate the blood. Or wait until sunset and donate the blood. Allah ta'ala jallu wa alam. Taib, subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa an. Astaghfiruk wa atubi alayk. Itlaik wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala Muhammad wa jizakum Allahu anna kulla khayr.